Uh, and so I said I had a Zoom with all of my singles just this week is that for me to tell 16 year olds to be celibate is one thing. A 37 year old who's used to getting some, I need a different kind of gospel. Yeah. So the church ain't telling me nothing about sex toys. They ain't saying nothing about the church telling me to be celibate. But my gynecologist is saying something got to happen down there because your stuff shutting down. Yeah. So we got to have real gospel for grown ups. I'm about to go to me. I'm about to go to Newburgh. <laughs> I'm going to Newburgh on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, John Davis, and this is Theology Today 101. I'm glad that you decided to join with us again on today. And I hope that if you do like today's video, you may think about subscribing to the channel. And if you do, uh, hit the bell notification. That way you can be notified when I post new videos. And also, you know, give a thumbs up, a like to this video as well. It does help uh, trying to get the uh, channels uh, spread out to more areas. And uh, I would appreciate it if you really did that. Well, you know, you, you guys know that we've been focusing in on this whole biblical uh, worldview. Uh, and that's what I've been kind of, you know, gearing my videos towards. But I also like to deal with certain current events. And uh, I want to just take a minute today to, to watch a video because it, it disturbed me so much in seeing this video uh, from this young pastor. Uh, and uh, I felt like I had to make a video for it. Uh, and I mean, it, it really, really uh, struck a nerve with me uh, about this video from this individual, because I think that uh, uh, he is a good representation of what people look at as the black church. And that's that's kind of what I've entitled this video today about the peril of the black church, because uh, and, 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 and again, when I'm saying this, I'm not saying this in some way of uh, uh, supporting or believing in some black church. There's no such thing as a black church. There's only the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church, the church of the Bible, the one that Jesus said that he would build himself. That's the only church. There is no black church. There is no white church. There is no Hispanic church. There is no Asian church. There is no Filipino church. No, there's just the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at this and we understand this, we start getting into these monikers that we use for church and we're making them into racial distinctives to where we have a black church or a white church and all these different type of churches. And I get where we're coming from. We're coming from that because we're using our cultural divide to kind of make sure that the church is kind of set up on some cultural basis. You know, you've heard the old saying before, the most segregated uh, 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 time of the week is on Sunday because people tend to go to the church that fits their culture, the church that fits their uh, uh, liking. And again, I'm not saying that there's anything inherently wrong with that. I understand that, you know, th that, that there is going to be more of a, a inclination to move towards church or a fellowship of believers that fit you more culturally. But the problem is, is when we begin to define the church from a racial definition. And I feel like that's where the black church is gone. I mean, the black church tends to pride itself on some racial uh, uh, distinctive that sets it apart from every other church. You know, like, like the black church is only clear for black people and the, the, the black church deals with black needs and, and black understandings. And then when we get into that type of language and that type of, uh, ideology, it begins to morph the church into something that is not only unbiblical, but borderline and frankly, heretical, you know, and I think where the black church is now is completely off the rails. I think the, uh, the, the train has completely left uh, the tracks and, uh, you know, it's kind of being fed by emotions. It's kind of being fed by politics. It's kind of being fed uh, by ideology. And it has completely overtaken uh, what many consider as the black church. And so I kind of want to talk about it. And I think this video kind of gives you a good summation, if you will, of where the black church is. And I'm going to be doing a little bit more talking about this because there is a movement that I think the black church needs to be aware of. And that movement is called the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. Now, again, the Black he Hebrew -like is uh, the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement has been around, you know, it's it, 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 it for a while. Uh, uh, it's not like it's anything new, but I believe that it's gaining teeth now because of the things that happened with Yee, Kanye, 
uh, the things that happened with Kyrie Irving, and then you've seen Jason Whitlock. He's uh, uh, kind of giving these guys a, a, a platform to speak about it, and I'm not against that. They, they can be able to speak about what their movement is talking about, but I think there's something greater going on with this, and uh, I'm not going to get into it in this video, but I do want to say that I think it's something that the black church is going to fall prey to pretty soon because the black church is already steep in liberation theology and activist theology uh, and progressivism. We are, the black church is already steeped in that type of theology, theological bent, theological framework. And so if it can just capture this whole black Hebrew Israelite thing, then you're going to have a perfect identity for the black church that has no identity right now. But I'll talk about that in a different video. But I think I wanted to make this video particularly about a guy that I think uh, kind of wants to be the face of the black church. I think he wants to be the next Martin Luther King. I don't think he's a pastor at all. I don't think he uh, even tries to be a pastor. I believe he's a political activist. I believe that he literally wants to be the next Martin Luther King Jr. He wants to be the next Al Sharpton. He wants to be the next uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. And that is uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Jamal Bryan. Uh, he is the pastor of New Birth Missionary Baptist Church here in Atlanta. Uh, he was once the uh, pastor of the Empowerment Temple uh, that was uh, AME Church that was in Baltimore. And a lot of you guys know him. If you have been living under a rock, you don't know who Dr. Jamal Bryan is. But if you have not been living under a rock, you know this individual. Uh, he's a very uh, polished speaker. Uh, he's a very uh, 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 educated man. He has legitimate degrees. He, he graduated from Morehouse. He has a Master's of Divinity from Duke University. Uh, he has a legitimate doctorate degree, a PhD. So he he is a very good success story uh, as far as uh, you know uh, his education. So I'm not going to deny that the guy is a is a very great orator. Uh, uh, he m has mastered the art of homiletics, uh, meaning the way to deliver the message. I mean, he knows how to do it, and he knows how to capture these key phrases uh, that King was good for. King wasn't good for theology, but he was good for catching key phrases. Reverend Jackson Jackson is very good of that. You see that same um, uh, mode of operation with Al Sharpton. All these guys are good at that. And I think Dr. Jamal Bryant is a, uh, a, a great candidate for who's going to carry on the, the hellish mantle of uh, leading the black church uh, completely away from biblical Christianity. And so I want to do a video that he did that I think uh, is something that is very uh, troubling. He did it with a young lady named Rashawn Ali. She has a podcast and uh, uh, the title of the hot podcast automatically is called Holy Smoke. And, uh, you know, it, it already has some issues going on with it already. And so I just want to kind of go through this video right quick and talk about it. Let me give you the first clip. How long ago in your life did he know that you were even anointed to even be in, in the ministry. Yeah, my dad knew that I was called to preach. He never wanted me to pastor. Uh, What's the difference for people that don't know? Okay, because my track has always been in civil rights. So I saw myself in the line of Reverend Shopton, Reverend Jackson, uh, but not over a local church. Now, I, I think this is interesting because if you look at what Jamal is saying here, he always saw himself, not as a pastor per se, but he saw himself as a, a civil rights activist. He said he saw himself in the line of, listen, listen who he, he looks at in the line of, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton. Guys, th th these are not ministers that you want to align yourself with. These are not individuals that you want to actually say are people you should align your path with because none of these guys, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, represent Christianity. They, they represent politics. They are political activists. They are civil rights uh, uh, ideologues. Uh, uh, they are, are, are race hustlers. Uh, they use race to fatten their pockets. Uh, they keep the black church into a state of frenzy by always focusing everything on race and skin color. This is what these individuals do, but this is who Jamal Bryant 
aligns himself was. He, he doesn't follow what it says over in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that this, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer or a bishop, he desires a noble task. No, he didn't desire to be an overseer. He didn't desire to be a bishop. He, he has no desire to really want to pastor a church. What does that mean? Shepherd people, grow them in their Christian faith, grow them in their walk with the Lord. No, he wants to be a political activist. That's what he always saw himself as. He, all, he kind of sees himself as just being thrown into this role as being the pastor, which he finds himself in. And this defines a lot of the black church. A lot of the black church has been swept away in the vortex, in the black hole of liberation theology, of activist theology, of progressionism. That's where the black church finds itself at. It's, it, and they use the Bible as a pretext to support all of these liberating liberation ideas these activist ideas, these progressive ideas that have nothing to do with actual biblical faith. And Jamal is just being honest. He didn't see himself as a pastor. He saw himself as a political rights, civil rights leader. And, I, and guess what? He still is today. That's exactly what he is. Let's keep going, guys. Uh, my When I was at Morehouse, I was a pre-law political science. I went to Duke for grad school, initially for law school. And, uh, you know, your eighth grade teacher tell you, you always need math the rest of your life. Yeah. I didn't believe her until I got into real estate law. Oh, right. I didn't know what was happening. Rashawn, I walked across that campus and signed up for seminary so quick. He, 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 found, he, he sort of found himself into seminary. But now he goes to this Duke University, which Duke is a great school, but it's not a great school for theology. Now, it looks good on the resume when you're trying to get a job out there in the world. It does. But it's not a, 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 a seminary that's going to anchor you in a grammatical, historical, literal interpretation of the word of God. It's not going to walk you through that. It's going to teach it as means of, of, of what's known as higher criticism, uh, 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 you know, uh, how to how to. Uh, read the Bible through a whole different interpretive lens. And this is exactly what Jamal Bryan does, you know? So this is, this is how he kind of got into this. This isn't some desire to want to shepherd people and have them grow in biblical faith. This is a desire to just, Hey man, I couldn't do uh, math. So I found myself over in the seminary. And, and, and again, if you go and talk to a lot of people that are a part of the black church, this is a lot of where it was. The black church got its focus and its rise by being political. If you were a black person, you had to kind of make your roots in the black church. You see, you, you, you had to get that stamp of approval because the black church was always anchored in politics. And, and, and Jamal is just telling you, hey, I didn't want to do this. I kind of found myself being thrown into this. And I think that's a, I think he's been honest in what he's saying. Let's keep going. I was national youth director at the NAACP overseeing 70,000 youth across the country, college campuses. And in 1999, Kwai C. Fume was our president. Mm -hmm. And at our national convention, he got laryngitis and asked me to give the national address. Oh, Lord. See, this is, this is what happens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I give the national address. I'm at that time 27 years old. It's the biggest night of my life. And uh, it's the first time I'm in USA Today. I'm on CNN as civil rights leader to watch at 27. Now, you hear Jamal talk about this, and he's kind of giving you his resume without giving you his resume. I mean, and you can hear it. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite remarkable. He's a young man, 27. He's director of the youth of the NAACP, you know, which already has its, its, its own issues. Um, I mean, he's a part of this whole civil rights thing. You know, he's a civil rights preacher, if you will, is young. So he's got his roots already established into these things, guys. And this is where he finds himself kind of anchoring him, you know, getting his uh, feet wet in the church. And, we, and, and, and the black church gets suckered into that kind of view where they're so big on looking at the outer appearance of what the guy says. Think of Al Sharpton knows how to put these statements out there. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson knows how to put these statements. Jamal Bryan knows how to speak. And we're so wrapped up into what they're saying and how they're saying it that we're not actually listening to what they are saying. And this is the exact thing that I want you to see here. Yeah, he has an impressive resume. But does that resume sound anything biblical? Did he mention anything about how he's anchored in truth? He's anchored in the word of God, how he was studying the scriptures. As a matter of fact, you go listen to this interview yourself. 
Jamal Bryan could be a preacher if Christianity didn't even exist. He, he, he could, it, it, let's say if the Bible didn't even exist, there is no Bible, Jamal Bryan could still be a preacher because he actually doesn't need a Bible to be a preacher because <laughs> he could just be one based upon his whole view of black America, his whole ideology from civil rights and liberation and activism. He can be a preacher like that. His brand of Christianity doesn't even need Jesus. It doesn't need scripture. It doesn't need church history because it's making up its own history. And this is what the black church is, guys. It, 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 think about it. Honestly, if you go listen to most people at black churches, they don't really need Jesus. Jesus is just a pretext to make it sound like it's Christian when really these churches could be fine if Jesus never existed. No, guys, that's just that's just not the case. Christianity is only real because Christ came as a man, died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended to the Father. And it is only by him that the church exists, not a black church, not a white church, but the church, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yes, the resume is impressive, but it means nothing as it relates to biblical Christianity. Let's keep going, guys. I get off of the stage and Dick Gregory is there when I walk off the stage. The, the Dick Gregory. Rashani grabs me by my collar and throws me up against the wall. And uh, I knew who he was from my parents' of records. Course, of course. But I had never met him before. And I'm going in my speech trying to figure out what did I do wrong. And I, I don't know what kind of family-friendly show this it's is. It's very family-friendly. Okay. Or, or not. You be okay. you. Okay. Okay. So he said the N-word mm -hmm. and threw me up against the wall and says, you are out of order. So I said, I'm out of order? He said, when I was growing up, black people, when they were in trouble, would call on two names, Jesus and the NAACP. He said, you are a part of a generation that doesn't call on either. He said, you belong in a church. Did Gregory, Gregory, who didn't even go to church, no, didn't even believe in church. So I tell people all over the world, it wasn't T.D. Jakes, it wasn't <laughs> Creflo. Dick Gregory called me in the past. <laughs> so wow. after that started my journey uh, towards being a pastor. Thanks. Do, do I need to say anything? Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. He says he tells people all over the world, Dick Gregory called him in the pastor. He said it wasn't Creflo. It wasn't T.D. Jakes. As if those individuals are actually good names that if they called you in the pastor, and that means you're your pastor. No, no, no. They're horrible. But Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory, you got called in the ministry by Dick Gregory. Guys, th th that's not a preacher. Where's Jesus in any of this? Where's the Bible? Where's a passion to want to see people grow in their faith? Grow in their faith and understanding of what Christ has come to do for them. Guys, throughout Christianity, you had people who died for the name of Christ. You had people who refused to deny the name of Christ and died at the hands of Roman emperors, that died at the hands of the Catholic popes, that died at the hands of, 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 of even Protestants who were killing Christians who didn't believe how they believed. You had people dying for the faith to stand on the fact that they believed and named the name of Christ. And here you have this fool saying that he was called into ministry by Dick Gregory. Guys, this is ridiculous. And Jamal Bryan ought to be ashamed of himself. Yeah, he's trying to be funny. Some of you may say, oh, he's just trying to be funny. That's just a joke. That's a horrible joke because here's the deal, guys. You're only called into ministry because the Lord Jesus Christ has blessed you and gifted you with that gift. And to take it as loose and, and cavalier and jokative as this man is taking it, he doesn't deserve to be in Christ. But let's just, I mean, in, in the, in, as a pastor, but let's be real. He's not one. He's not one. He's not one, guys. He's a political activist. He told us that at the very beginning. Let's keep going. Uh, you got to deal with the fact that in one day, uh, Rashawn, I preach at Megafest. And the next day, I'm the co-chair of the Million Man March. So I'm operating in two different levels. Uh, I'm the same person 
who does the uh, funeral for Biggie and for Tupac. So I'm I'm in all different kind of worlds that are beyond just church worlds. Yeah. <laughs> Again, name dropping. You know, so he's at Mega Mess. Then he's over at, at at the Million Man March, and now he's preaching Tupac's funeral. He's preaching Biggie's funeral. So what? Was the gospel presented at Biggie's funeral? Was the gospel presented at at, 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 at Tupac's a funeral? As you were the chairman of the million, co-chair of the Million Man March, was this was the Million Man March about the gospel? No, it was it was hosted by Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam. Guys, listen to this. None of this has anything to do with Christianity, but this is how the black church is purporting itself. This, this these are our leaders that they tell us are the leaders of the black church, which honestly have nothing to do with church. These are not churches. These are political organizations. These are pastors masquerading as men of God when they're really what guys? Ministers of Satan, as it says over in 2 Corinthians 11. And this, you're listening to his own words. And I'm telling you, man, we got to talk more about this because this is a problem that I see. So you had to, you, you had to have gone through these things. Oh, yeah. To be able to be where you are. Absolutely. And when you're on, when you're, when you're on the pulpit, when you're, when you're standing on stage. Yeah. Do you think that level of vulnerability and the things that you've actually been through, do you think that that resonates more with the everyday person that's yeah. looking at you? Yeah, I think I had to because humility is not a natural gift for me. It's not. No, life made me that. So I don't know, had I not gone through that, what my comportment would be. Huh. I, I'd have to... The only way I'm here is by grace. You know, otherwise I'd be in this room by gift. <laughs> uh, he says humility is not his natural gift. When, guys, I want to be clear with you. Nobody's natural gift is humility. Humility is only something that the Holy Spirit works through you. And if you see humility in Jamal Bryant, then you don't know humility. This guy's as prideful as it comes. Go, go listen to him at his church. Go listen at him at his interviews. Go look at his commercials that he runs for New Birth. Guys, you don't see anything humble about this guy at all. This guy is straight up prideful, but yet and still he believes he's humble. And notice what it is. She's asking him a question, you know, because they talked about some of the things he's gone through. And I don't want to go through any of his sins because, you know, we're all sinners and I don't want to go through that. You can go and read about that. We know some of the issues that he's gone through in his own personal life. But he's using those things to say, hey, you know, this is the reason why I am today. In other words, Again, the black church prides itself on experience. In other words, the reason why I'm so anointed is because of what I've gone through. The reason why my church is successful or I've reached this platform or God has given me this voice within the black community is because of what I've gone, for, gone through. Nothing has to do with God raising me up to help bring people into the body of Christ bring people into a greater view of who Christ is, bring people into a greater understanding of how the Holy Spirit works in their life, bring people into a view on a greater understanding of God, a greater biblical mindset that will help them navigate through the world. No, no, no. That's not reason why I have the platform. The reason why I have this platform, because I've gone through a whole lot, man, God had to humble me. He had it. I, I, I've worked hard for this anointing. This is what prides the black church. It's almost like we worship our experiences. We, we actually don't like our experiences of the Jim Crow South or slavery and all those kind of things, but we use those things as points of worship that keep us anchored on why we have a voice today. In other words, we're almost like ancestor worship. I mean, we, we, we worship those things. Well, no, this... That has nothing to his experiences have nothing to do why he has a platform. He has a platform today because he's the devil's spokesman. That's why he has a platform. Not because God has given him one. No, God is only sovereignly allowing him to operate like that. So that those who already do not want to believe the gospel will be fed a lie by this individual. 
But this has nothing to do with grace. He says, oh, I'm here by grace or else I'll be here by 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 by, by his uh, 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 talent, you know, what, however he puts it. No, guys, he, Jamal is talented. This, grace has nothing to do with it. You know, he's alive and hasn't been killed by God by grace because of the lies that he teaches. But make no mistake about it, guys. This has nothing to do with grace. He's there because he's gifted in what he can do and gifted in how he speaks. And he carries the right resume. And let's just be honest, the black church eats him up. Just like we eat up Dr. Martin Luther King without knowing anything about this man's ideology and what he actually believed as a theological quote unquote Christian, which he was not. We don't want to talk about that. We eat up all of these people, Al Sharpton, Reverend Jesse Jackson, as if they're people that we should love and support and they represent us. No, guys. No, no. Jamal Bryan's not there because of grace. He's there because he's gifted. And he knows exactly how to tug on people's emotion to get the response that he needs to get from them. Let's keep going. The people, the people just need hope. Yeah. And to be able to take on that task... Pastor Jamal, it's, it's, it's a lot. How do you continue? And now that you're saying everybody's back in church now, right. and I and I look at look at your look at your page. I, I follow you, right. so I look at your page and I see people are back and like it's like the old new birth. All right? Do you ever sit in it and say, God, thank? I mean, what what do you do when you sit in when you see the people back? Yeah. Like like. Despite anything that happened with, yes. with, with, with Bishop Long, yes. you see people in those seats like he had them in those seats. What Rash does that make you feel like? Rashawn, it is one thing reminding a woman she's beautiful mm. is something altogether different convincing her she's beautiful. New Birth has always been the lead church. They needed to be reminded Ooh. You know? <laughs> yeah. that this is who we are. Y'all shake it off. Come on. Put on that lipstick, put on some heels. You got this. Mm. That's a very interesting statement, man. You know, she says that, you know, people just need hope. And what she's talking about is if you, you know, know anything about the history of New Birth and the, the scandal thing that it went through uh, with Bishop Eddie Long before he passed away and all the things that happened and the accusations of homosexuality and grooming boys and all these different things that happened with Bishop Eddie Long here in Atlanta. Uh, that's what she's talking about, that the people needed hope. You know, they they, they, they went through something. No, guys, the, the people needed the gospel. That's what they needed at New Birth. Because New Birth never got the gospel under Eddie Long. No, what New Birth got was that they were the lead church in America, that, that, that they were uh, the, 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 the mighty New Birth. You know, they, they were uh, 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 taking authority. That's what they got. They never got the gospel. You follow what I mean? You know, you didn't get it from Bishop Eddie Long. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, you could have got it in the individual class that maybe you went through. And I'm not saying by any means that there were not some saved individuals that actually went to Newburgh. There are always saved individuals that go to all false churches, guys, You because the power of the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ is going to save those who are called and have been given to Christ before the foundation of the world. So even with a a, 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 a wrong interpretation and view of the gospel being presented, it still has enough power if presented to be able to save individuals. But that in no means means that this is a true church and what it's teaching. And so what Jamal says is all new birth needed to do is be reminded of who they were.
No, they didn't need the gospel. In other words, he needed to go and remind them, you know what? You're the prettiest girl in Atlanta. You're the finest girl in here, man. Hold your head up, man. You Forget all that stuff that happened, man. Forget all that past. No, we don't need to clean the elder board out. We don't need to clean the deacon board out. We don't need to find out whether spiritual rot happened in the church. We don't need to do any of that. The only thing we need to do is just be reminded of who we are and put on a, some lipstick, put on some high heels, man, and get out there and stretch your stuff and start getting these people back. And that is exactly who they got to be the pastor to help remind New Birth of who they were. And this is what this man is doing, guys. This, this is it. This is it. This is how I think he represents, I, I'm serious, a, a, a good picture of the black church. Uh, it, it's sad. It, it really is. So I'm one of those people. That's me. I grew up Christian. I grew yes. up uh, uh, with um, Pastor Hubert Shepherd, okay. Greater Travelers Rest Baptist oh, Church, yes. way back in the day. That's yes. where I grew up. But I have since become more spiritual yes. than religious. Yes. For people like me, yes. and my mom feels like I and and I and I was very when I was thinking about this interview, <clears throat> I wanted to be very respectful of where you stand and then where I stand. But I always, for people who have grown up Christian, mm -hmm. who have now taken more of the spiritual life, yes. um, because I'm more kind than I am in church on Sunday. Yes. Um, what do you say to me? Does anybody know what Rashawn is talking about here? Rashawn Ali? Basically, she's saying she grew up Christian, but she's not Christian. I, guys, I, I'm, she didn't grow up Christian. She, 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 she's never been a Christian. She literally is telling a pastor that, what do, what do you say to me? I grew up Christian, but I'm not Christian. So I'm not a Christian. I, I'm, I'm interviewing a quote unquote Christian pastor. I'm telling you that I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Christian at all. I used to be one, but I'm not one. There's no such thing as that because she never was a Christian in the first place. But this is what she's saying. This is a perfect opportunity. I mean, she literally... Uh, lofted a, a softball up there for Jamal to use the gospel bat and knock it out of the park. This is an opportunity to give this young lady the gospel. This is an opportunity to, to, to even if you believe she's backslidden, this is an opportunity to preach Christ to her, to bring her back to the faith. How do you think Jamal Bryan is going to answer this question? I would say to you, this is the largest demographic of Africans living in America who don't go to church. And it is testament not to you, but the failure of the evolving of the church. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. Uh, Black Lives Matter is a stumbling block for the church mm. because it is the very first civil rights movement in the history of America that one did not come out of the church and two is not led by a religious figure. And what uh, my grandmother would put it this way, your slip is showing, mm. is that <laughs> the black church has exposed that they don't know how to support what they don't lead. Uh, and so what the church has to do is really repackage itself. He, he, he's going to go on to say more, but he doesn't give it a gospel. He says the problem of you and why are you like that? Because this is the largest demographic of people who don't black community, who doesn't go to church. And the problem is because the black church hasn't repackaged itself. It hasn't reinvented itself to, 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 to deal with you and your group. No, no, this has nothing to do with maybe telling this young lady, well, well, well your experience in the church probably wasn't an accurate experience of what Christ has really provided for what he's really come to do. No, he doesn't give her the gospel. He gives her the black church. And this is what the black church is good at. It doesn't give people the gospel of Jesus Christ. It gives people the black church. It gives people a place that they can be a part of, that their blackness can shine at. It gives them liberation theology. It gives them activism. It gives them a political party to join to. It gives them uh, issues that they can talk about. It gives them a social club that they can go to and be a part of, but it doesn't give them the gospel. Am I saying every black church does that? I'm not saying every black church does that because I'm a black man, as you can see, and I don't do that in my church. And I know other black people who don't do that at their church, but I'm saying as a whole, if we're looking at the black church as a whole, it tends to give people 
people the black church. It gives people liberation. It gives them a place that instead of giving them the gospel, it wants to build a community that they can identify with from whatever spectrum of life they come from. It doesn't give them the gospel. And that's exactly what Jamal Bryan does here. He doesn't give this young lady the gospel. He says, you know what? The problem with the why you're not a Christian anymore is because we haven't learned how to repackage ourselves. And then he goes into Black Lives Matter and said that the problem of it is, is man, you know, we don't know how to follow a movement and get behind a movement if we didn't lead because the Black Lives Matter didn't start it from the church. It started from people who were not from the church. The Black Lives Matter movement is a joke. It's, it started by three women who were lesbians and they're, that are communists, that are Marxists. Has nothing to do with the church. But yet still, that's the issue. That's the problem. Guys, these are lies, man. Uh, is that uh, the black church is almost in leave it to beaver. Mm. So we see family as a husband and a wife and two kids and marginalized single parents. Uh, 98% of black churches have a youth ministry, but have nothing for kids with special needs. Mm. Uh, the largest demographic in our community for the very first time, they're more seniors than teenagers. So, Rashawn, it's hard to believe there are more nursing homes than there are middle schools. So most black churches have a youth pastor, but don't have a seniors pastor. Mm. Guys, what what is any of what this man is talking about have anything to do with what she asked? She says, what do you say to me? H have you heard the gospel? Have you heard anything about sin? Have you heard anything about grace? Have you heard anything about repentance and, 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 and believe in faith in Jesus Christ? Have you heard anything about that? No, you're hearing black church issues. Guys, you're hearing politics. You're hearing activism. You're hearing cultural issues. And this is what the black church is sunken into. It doesn't preach Jesus anymore. It preaches culture. It preaches activism. It preaches, it preaches racial issues instead of really dealing with gospel issues, sin issues, getting people to put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not their skin color. All these things are absent there. And this man is continually giving this woman statistics rather than giving her the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, we have to look at this and really shake our head at where we have fallen. Man. Let's so the stuff that was applicable for your grandmother means nothing to you. Uh, and so I said I had a Zoom with all of my singles just this week is that for me to tell 16-year-olds to be celibate is one thing. A 37-year-old who's used to getting some, I need a different kind of gospel. Yeah. So the church ain't telling me nothing about sex toys. They ain't saying nothing about the church telling me to be celibate, but my gynecologist is saying something got to happen down there because your stuff's shutting down. Yeah. So we got to have real gospel for grown-ups. I'm about to go to, me. I'm about to, go to Newburgh. <laughs> I'm going to Newburgh on Sunday. <laughs> no, no, no. So Wow. Guys, he said we got to have a different gospel. He actually says that telling a 37-year-old who's used to getting some about sex toys is a gospel. It's a gospel that what he tells a 16-year-old who about celibacy and a 37 year old who's used to getting some about sex toys, that, 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 that that's a gospel. Because that's not a gospel. And if you are listening to that and you think that this is what Christ is pleased with, that this is what how we need to rebrand ourselves. And did you hear her? She's laughing and saying, I'm gonna go to Newburgh. I, I, I gotta go to Newburgh. Oh, of course. If you're going to go to a church that's going to teach you about sex toys and, 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 and heck, you may as well open up a sex shop at your church. If you're going to have a church that does this, what sinner is not going to want to be a part of that where they can have their sins gratified 
right there at church. What does it remind you of? It reminds you of the first century, uh, what was going on in Asia Minor, what was going on in Ephesus, what was going on in Corinthian. What do I mean of that? Remember when, when Paul was calling those individuals out of the pagan culture of the Gentile churches, what was going on? They were going down to the Gentile temples and they were having orgies and sex orgies and with the temple prostitutes and doing all this thing. Who wouldn't want to go down to the temple if that's what's going to happen at the temple? Well, guess what, guys? We're taking the black church and we're turning it into that. Guys, this isn't a gospel. This is satanic. No, you need to tell that 37-year-old that if they go out there and commit fornication, they're sinning just like you tell the 16-year-old. Sin doesn't change because the ages change. It's all the same thing. But let Jamal Bryan tell it, no, here's what we need to do to help get Rashad Ali back in the church. We need to offer classes on sex toys. We need to give you more information about sex toys because the the gynecologist says you got to do something with that down there. Guys, oh my God, this, I can't believe that I have to make a video to, and, and people would actually go to this man's church and defend this. This is absolute satanic doctrine that's being spewed out to a woman who pretty much said, what would you tell me? He doesn't give her the gospel, he gives her Satanism. Uh, it, the church is not relatable yeah. uh, to our generation and down. So imagine when I was growing up, they were telling you, don't have your phone on in church. I'm telling y'all, turn your phone on, take a selfie, use hashtag new birth now uh, so that we can move forward. Society, Rashawn, changes every four years, but church culture changes every four years, but church culture changes every 20. So the average church is 15 years behind schedule. So those of you who watching, your church is so proud to be on Facebook, but all the youth are on TikTok. They are. They stopped being on Facebook when their mother tried to friend them. So you got to figure out how am I relevant and how do I repackage? He actually is the truth. I mean, the church is behind the cultural times. You want to know why? Because the, the church, the true church is stuck in the Bible. The true church is stuck in the Bible that was given to us almost 2000 years ago by the men who wrote it. So we are behind the culture because the church was never meant to follow the culture. The church was never meant to be cultural. The church was always meant to be anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ that was given to us, solidified in his word. That's where the church is. So. I have no problem with saying to you, I am behind the culture. Why? Because I'm standing behind the Bible. But for Jamal Bryant, no, no, no. We're not relevant because we're behind. We're 20 years behind the culture. Guess what? So as the culture evolves, the church needs to evolve. Wow. So what happens if the culture is embracing the things that we see today? Does the church need to evolve into that? Guess what, guys? They do. And that's exactly what we see going on today. This is exactly what we see going on in the black church. So the reason why Rashad Ali is no longer in church and what he would tell this woman who's spiritual, who's no longer a Christian, hey man, we need to rebrand ourselves to you. That's what we need to do. We need to change the message so it can attract you. Not stick to the message of what Jesus says. We're no longer trying to please Jesus. We're trying to please sinners. So I understand you are... Spiritual is what you want to call it um, because we don't have a terminology of how do I love God when I hate the church? Mm. Uh, and can I love him uh, without hating the politics of church? And so- Wow. Listen to this. He says the reason for you is that we don't have a category for you because your issue is how do you love, how can you love God and hate the church? Does that make any sense? as if the church is some organization that is disconnected from God. No, the church is called the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot love God and hate the church because the church is the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church has been brought into Christ. The church is what Christ is building in the world. To hate the church is to hate Christ. To hate the church is to hate God. No, the reason why people don't want to be a part of the church is because 
if the church is preaching truth, they don't want to be told that what they're doing is wrong. They don't want to be told that what they're doing is sinful. They don't want anybody judging their actions. They don't. They want to be free to be able to do whatever they want to be able to do, to think however they want to think, to act however they want to think. And when they're coming against those type things and they hear that in scripture because maybe you have a, a, a minister who's preaching the word of God. They don't like that. They feel that that is archaic and we need to step into the uh, 21st century. That's why they run and lead the church because as Romans 1 says, they suppress the truth of God. That's why they lead. So churches blew up in the pandemic and they're not doing their due diligence. Why? They grew up because we went virtual. So now I can go to church and I ain't got to worry about being judged by what I got on. Right. Now I can go to church uh, and you ain't going to judge me because of my tattoos, because of my piercings, or because I have a same-sex same sex lover. Yes. Uh, so, mm. so churches blew up because now I can go to church and come in however I want to live, however I want. Think about it. Because with online church, I can. I can live in whatever lifestyle I want to live in. I can be whoever I want to be. I can be a homosexual. I can be a transgender. I can be whatever I want to be and still call myself a Christian because I don't have to actually come to church to where I can actually be judged by living that type of lifestyle. And that's exactly what Jamal Bryan is praising here. He's saying that this is why the churches end up blowing up and going bigger. But guys, I'm telling you, that is a false presentation of the gospel because that is no gospel at all. That is a lie. The churches blew up because people don't want to be judged. They don't want to be told that they're wrong. So therefore they stand on a incorrect, unbiblical view. And that's where their focus is. And so I think that the black church has got to have a real come to Jesus meeting mm -hmm. uh, and get into the 21st century. I got up, Rashawn, after the Supreme Court uh, ruling, about uh, that new birth and me are pro-choice because Jesus is. Right. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you decide to let me in, that's pro-choice. Huh. God in the Garden of Eden said to Adam and Eve, all of these trees are available to you. I want you to pick those. I'm not putting this other tree behind barbed wire and the ADT alarm. Don't eat it, but that's your choice. Yes. Christianity in and to itself is pro-choice. This is a ridiculous argument that pro-choice people like to use. He says he stood up before his church and he told him that him and the church was pro-choice because God is pro-choice. Here's the one question. I'm not even going to spend time on this because this is easy. When somebody tries to say that they're pro-choice because Christianity is pro-choice, Jesus gives you a choice. Here's what you need to ask that individual. Yes, Jesus does give you a choice, but what happens if you don't make the choice to choose him? What happens if you reject Christ? What happens if you choose not to follow Christ? What happens? You follow what I mean? No, for those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, the consequences is eternity in hell. Here's what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curses, Choose life so you and your descendants may live. Guess what, guys? If the choice is between life and death, how is that truly a choice? No, God has given mankind the ability called volition. We can make choices, but those choices are not free of the consequences of whatever choice we make. And this is the argument that pro-choice people don't understand. This is a ridiculous argument from a Christian pastor who is saying that Jesus gives you the right to make a choice. But what happens if you don't make the choice? What happens to that individual if they reject Christ? Well, guess what? We already know according to what the scripture says. So no, you want to make sure instead of him saying no, he should be encouraging people to make the right choice, which is Christ, to live in the right choice, which is to accept the Lord Jesus. It express that you're not supposed to be killing image bearers, babies in the womb. No, instead of him uh, 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 positioning that position in the world, pro-life. No, he wants to position pro-choice as if Adam and Eve did have a choice to bite the, the, the wrong tree. But what happened when they both when they bit the wrong tree? It led to the fall of mankind. You follow what I mean? Yes, you can make choices, but those choices are not free. And guys, 
This is a horrible argument that we that people like to use who are pro-choice that you can easily combat them by saying, hey, you're right. Jesus does give you the right to make a choice. But what happens if you don't choose him? But we don't say anything because a lot of black churches are white evangelicals in drag and they don't know who it is that they are because their politics are thrown off and don't really speak to, you okay? I'm good, I'm fine. (laughs) Don't really speak to what's happening in the culture. There you have it. He says the black church is really a right evangelicals in drag. That's horrible. Number one, that's racist, but it's horrible. And, and here's this woman about to fall off her seat because, you know, the way she's acting in the video, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm going to leave that alone. But I, it, it's ridiculous because none of what this man's saying is truth. None of what he's saying is biblical, guys. And, 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 the, and the black church doesn't need to be relevant. The black church needs to be biblical. So it's not about making the church relevant. You're not supposed to make the church sinner friendly. No, the church is there to please the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's there for. And that's what he's supposed to be doing, not trying to make anything that sounds ridiculous of these statements that he's making right here, guys. So how are you leading in like how are you leading in this effort to try to change the narrative? Or are you just saying, you know what, this is what I'm gonna do and help my help the people that are in my congregation? How are you making sure that more people think like this or at least have this type of conversation yeah. so that they can try to change their thought process. Yeah. I had to pause it there because this is when the conversation completely goes off the rails, if you ask me, because I mean, it's it's already been off the rails. I, I, I don't want to make it in any kind of way that the conversation has been sane. No, Jamal Bryan is a horrible pastor. He's a horrible excuse for a Christian. And Everything that he's saying is totally wrong. It's not correct in any kind of way. But when he makes this point here, this is where I really believe that, you know, honestly, I, 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 he, he should be fired as a pastor. He, he should be completely let go from his reign as a pastor because what he's about to say here is absolutely ridiculous. But it doesn't surprise me because I can see the black church going down this. You, you want to be relevant? Well, guess what? This man right here is about to give you some relevancy right off the bat. Listen to what it says right here. Because I'm mindful that I'm not after Christians. I'm after people who don't go to church. And a lot of churches are just recycling people from other churches. That's not who I'm after. I'm looking for people that smell like weed. I'm, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm at a place, Rashawn. His, no, 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 really, is <laughs> New Birth is the largest land-owning black church in America. Wow. And so my position to my deacons is, why aren't we not raising cannabis? I'll be able to bring in black males. They're able to do it legally. Mm. I'm teaching them farming. Oh my God. I'm helping them to enhance the ecosystem. Uh, th- th- this is the kind of conversation. So if the guy, black boy in Bankhead said, they grown weed at the church, where do I join? Yes. I don't need no pamphlet for him. Mm. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> he coming in. He coming in. And that, that's the group that I'm going after. Wow. So let me get this straight, because you're going after the ones who smell like weed. Those are the ones you're going after. Let's take this land that we have, since we're the largest land owning black church in America, and let's make a cannabis farm, which cannabis is growing weed, so we can bring in people who like to smoke weed. Guys, if you do that, then why not open up a strip club in the church for people who like to go to strip clubs? Why not put a, uh, a, a a crack house in the church for those who like to do crack? And therefore, they can do it in a safe environment. Uh, uh, they can have clean needles and pipes. This is ridiculous. So in order to reach the world, we become the world. 
And I know people like to use that verse that Paul says, I became all things to all men that I should win some. It, 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 you don't use that verse as if Paul became a pagan so that he could win pagans. Did you see Paul going into the temple prostitute saying, hey, man, I'm just trying to relate to what these guys are doing. I want them to know that I'm just like them. I don't want them to think that I'm judging them. So let me partake of this temple prostitute. Let me partake of this Diana worship so I can let them know, hey, man, we're all on the same level. No, you don't see that. You don't see Jesus going. And you said, well, Jesus hung out with sinners. Yeah, but you you don't see any in any portion of scripture where Jesus was getting drunk with the sinners. Or Jesus was saying, hey, man, let's let, let, let's be drunk with them. Let's let's when in Rome, let's do as the Romans do. No, you don't see any of that type of attitude. But this is what you're seeing here. Because, guys, even though I know that what this man is saying is absolute lunacy, I can picture the black church going down this route because we've already embraced liberation theology. We've already embraced embrace activism. We've already embraced the LGBTQ. We've already embraced uh, 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 abortion. We've already embraced uh, transgenderism. We've already embraced all of these uh, 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 left wing positions. Why not weed? Why not? Why not black Hebrew Israelite? Because we were already going down this road. Why not do this? You want to know? Because the moment the Bible ceases to be the final authority, and now we can just make up a faith that suits cultural identities is the moment we're going to be led astray by every heretical movement that comes along. This man is ridiculous. Yeah, his church will grow. I, I, I got some people I know. If you tell them you got weed down at the church, they come in the church. And if you're going to go read and cannabis at the church, then you may as well let them smoke it right there on the ground. Let it smoke them right there in the sanctuary. Hey, why don't you fire up one Jamal while you're preaching? Because if that's the case, man, if we're going to start growing weed at the church, then hey, man, let's make a distillery. Let's do something. Let's start making beer at the church. Let's start uh, uh, making our own liquor at the church. Let's 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 just bring it all in so that way we can reach all the people who will not come to church unless they know the church is having growing weed, selling alcohol, having a strip show. Uh, 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 having a good social club for uh, all my different relationships. Hey, if you make church like that, they're going to come. Guys, this is ridiculous. And I'm telling you, man, we need to pray for the black church. I'm going to play this last clip and then I'm going to end the video. That it has to be repackaged and repurposed or else uh, I want to announce on Rashawn's podcast for the very first time you are getting ready to witness the death of mega churches. Oh. <laughs> Our children will not be going to mega churches. They will be watching online. And that which used to be sanctuaries will be studios. So those who are caught in these wooden pews, get ready to sell them on eBay. Uh, because if you don't repackage, then your church is going to be a condo. Guys, I feel like that the black church will die. If it goes down this path of the path that it has been on, it's going to die if, if, it's, if it's not already dead. Because we got to get back to biblical faith. We got to get back to biblical Christianity. We got to get back to an orthodox view of the scriptures. And it starts with the pulpits. First, we got to get charlatans like this man out of the pulpit. We got to stop supporting this foolishness. We got to stop supporting this. We cannot act like this is Christianity, guys. It's not. This is going to lead a lot of people astray and it's going to lead a lot of people to hell. So we first have to start with that. The judgment has to start right there in the house of God. We've got a clean house. We've got to do like the Lord Jesus Christ and take the whip and run the money changers out of the temple. Before we can ever deal with the people who are being led astray by sheep, by, by wolves, I'm sorry. Like Jamal Bryant. So guys, let's pray for him, man. Let's pray that he repents. Let's pray that he repents of this foolishness and he comes to truly find Jesus Christ. Let's pray that he recognizes that this is not the way to go. That this is not what Christ has called for his church. And more importantly, guys, this does not in any way glorify Jesus Christ in the earth. So guys, if you like today's video, make sure you hit the like button. 
Also, if you want to subscribe to the channel, hit that subscribe button and also hit the bell notification. That way you can be notified when I post new videos. So until then, we'll see you on the next go round. God bless. Thank you.